Amen. Beautiful. Thank you, Benson. Good morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday to all of you, whether here in person or online. Hosanna, Hosanna to each and every one of you. I'm excited to get to worship with all of you. If you are here with us in person, here's how things happen around here. If you need anything at all throughout the course of our service, you can find help in the back of the room in our hospitality team, and they'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. If you're looking for restrooms, you can find them out the door on your right-hand side on that hall down there. We have nursery care available for ages zero through four. Some of them are back there now. We'll see them here um, in a minute. We'll have kids' time today. If that's a good time for dismissal for you, feel free to do that then. There's also kids' goodie bags um, in the back on the table immediately outside the sanctuary door, so that's helpful for you as well. You should have received a worship handout when you came in with a bunch of stuff that's happened in the life of our church, so be sure to check that out. And there's a digital version available for you all online as well. There's also Connect cards somewhere around you. Uh, that's a way that we can know what you need us to be praying for you about, how you can be involved, change of information, all of that. And of course, letting us know you were here with us in worship. That is a bunch of help. And there's a digital version available online as well. Uh, today in worship, we're excited to have a palm parade, which we'll have in a minute during our opening song. If you'd like to participate, it's going to be our kids walking around with their leaders. If anybody wants to participate, feel free and hop up and, and go around. You don't have to go back to the nursery. You can go back to your seat. Um, but it's going to be a bunch of fun. We look forward to that. So make sure that you wave your palms. Also, since this is the start of Holy Week, we have more festivities happening this week. On Thursday at 7 p.m. here at the church in the Fellowship Hall, we'll have a unique worship experience for Monday, Thursday. Where we'll have shared conversation and discussion around the Last Supper, which is what it would have been like for Jesus and the disciples. And so we'll share the same type of conversation. Good Friday is going to be available online only on demand. You can find that on Facebook or YouTube at any point throughout the course of the day on Friday for Good Friday, so take advantage of that. And of course, Easter Sunday is coming next Sunday, March 31st at 10 a.m. Please uh, feel free to invite your friends, your family, around the church places. You should find little cards. If you're here last week, we had them as well. Feel free to use those as invite cards to let somebody know you would love to worship our risen King with them. If you would like to adorn our altar with, with Easter lilies and flowers, feel free to do that. You can pick those up on your own. And if they're in memory or honor of somebody else, please contact the church office by the end of the day tomorrow so we can make sure we can get that printed and, um, and have your, your, honor, your honoree um, honored in our print material. So please take advantage of that. Also, this week happening on a busy Holy Week for us is Free Cafe on Wednesday. There's a sign-up sheet out there um, underneath the TV that we would love for you to help out with. If you want to bring something, if you want to help deliver, if you want to help prepare, if you want to help clean up, or feel free to just come and enjoy the meal. That's what it's there for, but sign-ups are right there. You can also find the constant contact via uh, uh, the, the sign-up genius via email if that's a better way for you to sign up as well. Whatever works best for you, take advantage of that. Lastly, and this is a lot more than we normally have, we have an AED training immediately after service today if you'd like to take part in that, especially our hospitality team. Um, we would love for you to have that. We have an AED here in church, and it does no good if we're not comfortable using it in the event that we have to. And so we would love for you to have as many, uh, us to have as many people trained on that and educated as they can. So in the event, we have comfortable people willing to aid and serve. So please join us for a brief time after service. We're going to pray together, we're going to sing God's praises, we're going to hear from God's word, all that and more. But let's get it started by rising to our feet and singing shouts of loud Hosanna together.
come to the able and join me in our call to worship, which you can follow along with on the screen, here in person or online. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow. For he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We wave palm branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to touch his walls. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. You all have a seat, and we're going to move into a time of sharing with our kiddos here. Anybody wants to come down, you can feel free to join us down here if you're not already. Hi, everybody. All right, you guys, even if you don't know it, you were just part of a parade. What's a parade? What is a parade? You know? What's a parade? Yeah. Yeah, people walk around and we're usually celebrating something, right? Maybe if, if you're familiar, we have lots of good parades here in town where you get candy, don't you? Do you like that? Bring your bags and you get your candy and they toss candy to you. We're celebrating something whenever we're a part of parades, but they don't normally involve this. This is weird, right? These palms. It's a little bit different. But today we remember when Jesus began his journey to the empty grave, when Jesus began his journey to Easter and they waved palms to welcome Jesus. And today we celebrate Jesus and we use a big fancy word, Hosanna. Can you say Hosanna? Hosanna. Hosanna. That means that we praise him and we welcome Jesus. We're reminded that no matter what happens, we should always celebrate Jesus. We can always celebrate Jesus together. And the best way to do that is with the way that we love each other. Okay? Will you pray with me? And big kids can pray too. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for Jesus. For Jesus. Even though, Even though not everything, not everything in, our lives in our lives happen the way we want, the way we want. Remind, us remind us we can always, we can always celebrate, Jesus. celebrate Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name, it's in Jesus name that, we pray together. that we pray together. Amen. 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 Are you going back to nursery? Feel free to do that or go back to your seat. And we're going to move into a time of sharing our first and first together. Well, just wait a second. <laughs> that sounds pretty wild going out there. Good luck to you guys. Very good. How about joys or concerns out there this morning? We got anything good going on over here? Oh, it's quiet. We've got a lot of faces. Lauren, good to see you. It's been a few days. Glad you're here with us. How about in this section? Got anything going on? Yeah, Bill. Uh, I feel called to say, glad to see Russ Green here. And I wish that we have prayers for him tomorrow as he goes through his surgery. Will do. We'll lift that up. My brother-in-law, Dale, is out of the hospital. I um, think that it was a reaction or the wrong antibiotic for a UTI that he had. Very good. So that's cleaned up and he's feeling better. Good deal. Anything else over here? Okay. How about in this section? Anything happening over here? Man, it's quiet. It's quiet. So... There you go, Ma Jerry. Good. <laughs> well, I have a joy. A lot of you may not think this, but Ed and I are adopting two baby kittens from the Humane Society. <laughs> two boys. We're thinking of names, but we had to have our cat put to sleep about a little over a month ago because he had cancer. 
So we're taking the plunge, and we, we're just going to get one. But we thought, well, two might be better, but we'll see. So <laughs> just keep us in our, your prayers. Two might be better, but two might be worse. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So we'll take votes on names. Anybody want to submit a name later, we'll, we'll take that. So how about over here? Oh, everybody's quiet today. How about the choir? Oh, man. Yeah, all right. Good job. Well, uh, so as uh, many people know that I'm a classical uh, musician, and well, I'm gonna have my concert, uh, my recital, upcoming recital set on the April 6th, which is on Saturday at seven, and it's in the concert hall in Mizu. And I will share more information with our like IT group, and so maybe they will post, the, they will show the poster maybe next week, or I will also bring a, like a, a photocopy of my poster. And well, I, I will play a few repertoires from uh, like Johann Sebastian Bach and like Beethoven and also like, uh, which is a romantic composer, which is American romantic composer, Edwards uh, McDowell. And his Celtic Sonata, which is influenced by uh, like a uh, Scottish legend, Celtics. And then I will also play uh, an modern piece, which is composed by Carl Wein, which who is one of the actually very famous like uh, classical composer and Australian uh, composer. He has been uh, praised as the Austra Australian uh, Beethoven <laughs> in like you know, modern Beethoven. And, and I will premiere one of his piece and that will be the uh, first premiere in uh, Midwest in the United States because it it was premiere in New York before. <laughs> so yeah, if you have free time on April 6th, feel free to just come join my concert. Thank you. Very good, that sounds good. I've been practicing my, my river dance stuff, so if I could, I'll dance, I'll come dance with the Celtic part of it. Yeah, that'd be really good. I could do a little jig, you know, it'd be pretty good. Very good. No, my wife says no, I'm sorry, you'll just, I'm sure your talents will be far exceeding anything I could add to it, so. <laughs> Guys, if you'll bow with me. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this beautiful day, God, and I thank you for Palm Sunday, and I thank you for your time when you came in and, and, and we celebrated you. <laughs> God, right before, right before we turned on you, God, but uh, Lord, I, uh, I just want you to know that we do love you and we know the outcome now, God, and we are grateful for that. God, we thank you that uh, Marianne's brother Dale is uh, out of the hospital and he's getting better and they figured out what was going on, God, but we are grateful that, uh, that that's, that's happened and that he's healing up, God. Lord, we uh, pray to you to just bless those two little kittens, God, and uh, just bless Jerry and Ed as they take on a whole new family and, uh, and go through that adventure, God. But uh, just thank you for, for pets and their wonderful, uh, <laughs> what they do for us in our lives, God, and I am grateful for that. Lord, uh, we pray for Tenson as he's having his concert coming up, God, and we just lift that up to you, God, and just bless him and be with him as he goes into that, God. We are grateful for his talents and uh, his gifts, God that he's able to share those, Lord, and we uh, just pray that you bless him and are with him through that. And God, we are um, uh, grateful to see Russ Green again here today, God, and but uh, he's having his surgery tomorrow, God, and just pray that that goes really well and uh, that then he continues to heal up and get better, God, and just bless him right now as he uh, is on the road to recovery, God, and uh, be with Bernice, too, as she's dealing with him and, uh, and, and helping him and taking care of him, God, and uh, we are grateful for her. Lord, we lift up other concerns, other things in other places in our hearts that are hurting or are sad or whatever might be going on, God, or angry, God, that you come into our, into our lives and you bless us in that, God, and you help us to heal from those hurts, God. And uh, we're just grateful uh, to you for that. God, we are sorry for those things that we cause hurt, and uh, we lift, I just pray for you to just bless us and help us to uh, forgive us in those things, God. 
And Lord, uh, we lift up online people watching right now. Uh, we lift up their concerns, their joys, and all that to you, God. And we just pray that you're with them and they can feel your presence right now. And God, we do love you very, very much. And we praise you, God. And we pray for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I think if you'll stand to sing. Today we welcome Jesus and celebrate Jesus, and I think the typical narrative of Palm Sunday is that we shout Hosanna on Sunday and crucify come Friday. But since we know the end of the story, what if this day is a day where we just celebrate, actually celebrate Jesus as King? We took the time to actually honor Him as King and be in awe of his holiness, his glory, his power, his might, and his mercy. There are a variety of ways that we recognize this. We believe as a church that we do this in the way that we worship, in the way that we learn, in the way that we serve, and in the way that we share in community. We seek God's glory by reading his word. We seek God's glory by worshiping together. And by spending time learning with, from, and for one another. And many of you know, this past week, our church was able to do something great to help make sure this happens for many more years to come. One of our adult classrooms and one of our children's classrooms were both renovated this week with the help of Legacy Giving. These rooms look absolutely fabulous, and because of this work, our church is setting itself up for Jesus to be glorified in many ways for generations to come. Sunday school, prayer groups, vacation Bible schools, outside groups like Boy Scouts and beyond use these facilities for the things that they do. And this church is more equipped now than ever to be inviting, welcoming, and hospitable to people of multiple age groups and for multiple purposes. And this shows that generosity is another way that we can respond to the glory of God. We see God's goodness and are compelled to create an abundance of goodness of our own so that God's glory may be multiplied in our midst. And one of the ways that we do this as a church is through a ministry called UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, which you've been hearing about this month and is our special offering this month, which you can give to um, online, and you can also give to in the small baskets in the back. And to learn a little bit more about all that they do, check this out. A 
Agency of the United Methodist Church, working with partners and churches in more than 125 countries to equip and transform people and places for God's mission. Global Ministries connects the church and mission through the sending of missionaries, evangelism and church revitalization, disaster response and recovery led by the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and global health. God calls missionaries from communities everywhere in the world to serve in communities anywhere in the world. More than 300 missionaries serve today as evangelists, health professionals, educators, and agriculturalists. They strive to strengthen neighborhoods, working with others to transform poverty into opportunity, injustice into equality. Missionaries care deeply about people, following Christ's example of unconditional love, going wherever God leads. At the heart of the church and mission is God's persistent call to make disciples who follow Jesus Christ, finding creative ways to express God's love in every community. The work of evangelism includes the cultivation of faith communities and new leaders, supporting a new church in an old neighborhood or an old church that welcomes new neighbors. Revitalizing churches leads to deeper conversations about building relationships, seeking partners, and embracing mutuality in mission. The United Methodist Committee on Relief marks its 80th anniversary in 2020. Founded in response to the devastation caused by the Second World War, today UMCOR works to alleviate human suffering through ministries and partnerships, addressing disaster response, global migration, sustainable development, and environmental care. At its core, UMCOR is a connection of people, volunteers, organizers, caseworkers, and counselors ready to serve all in need. Global Ministries responds to the world's need for mental, physical, and spiritual well-being through global health. Our health ministries reach vulnerable communities that have little access to medical help or other life-saving measures. More than 300 clinics and hospitals refurbished for service, a network of health professionals working together, medical supplies and equipment, medicine to treat diseases, and vaccines to prevent them from spreading are signs of global health at work. The church in mission is the church alive, fully open, reaching out in God's love, even when our buildings are closed during a pandemic. This mission, made possible by you, belongs to you and all United Methodists connected to God, to one another, and to the world. Together, we await the leading of the Spirit in ways not yet seen, trusting in God's purpose and God's word. You can give to this effort in a variety of ways, but that's just part of what you're supporting when you support a ministry like UMCOR. Let us pray together to give God thanks and ask God to continue to move us into the future in our giving and as a church. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road shouting, Hosanna, as Jesus passed. And we know they were not looking for a Messiah who is different from who you sent Jesus to be. Not one of political power and military might, but one who came in compassion and mercy to heal, to love, and to save. So search our hearts that we might be confident that the Messiah for whom we long is the one who you know we need. Jesus the Christ, your anointed one in whose name we now complete our prayer by lifting our voices as one, saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praises we bring to Him for Christ's 
So before we get going, I kind of wanted to provide us with a, a brief uh, recap with where we've been over the last few weeks as we move out of Lent and now into Holy Week. Lent, of course, a time where we focus on our need for repentance as we look forward to the cross and look forward ultimately to the empty grave. We recognize why that was necessary. And that's what Lent has been all about for, uh, about, all about for us as we've been in this series called Mourn Again, where we've been trying to focus on our need for mourning, which is different than guilt, which is different than shame, but our need to mourn that we might repent. And Pastor Craig offered a great message about how we must first recognize our need for this. We must recognize uh, the brokenness within us in order that we can mourn it properly and move on from it. Pastor Mark shared a story about the death of Lazarus and how lament and mourning and also hope are all tied together within this gospel um, of Jesus. And last week we shared a message from Philippians, the Apostle Paul, to talk about how our focus determines our future. And so we don't talk about repentance and we don't talk about sin and how we need to look back so that we can focus on it and feel bad, but instead Mourning allows us to see what God can do with it and what God has done with it. And that can become our focus because Jesus has redefined our future. And today is Palm Sunday where we're going to take a look at how we can honor God. How we can once again be in awe of who God is and understand that that's how we are changed. But to start it, I want to play a game. And I'm going to show you some, some pictures of places that I've been around the world, and I want to see if you all can take it. And some of them are going to be easy, and some are going to be hard, okay? So bear with me. Um, <clears throat> see if anybody can guess. There's a couple of them that if you know it, I'm astounded. Uh, but we'll see. Where's that? Does anybody want to say guess where that is? That is in uh, Poaz Volcano National Park in Costa Rica. So that's an active volcano that I was standing on the top of. Um, and took a hike up, that was really cool. What about that one? That is, that is the Sea of Galilee. That's the Sea of Galilee in Israel. Um, I've been there about three times. Where's that? That's Disney World. That's in Orlando, Florida at Disney World. Not Disneyland, that's Disney World in Orlando, Florida. I'm proud, I'm proud that I was there for this one. So I heard Ireland, you're close. That's Loch Ness in Scotland. Um, a rainbow happened. It was raining while we were there. It was kind of a pretty crazy moment uh, while we were there, but yeah, pretty cool. So that's Loch Ness in Scotland. That is in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Oahu in Hawaii, that one. And I've got two for this next one because it's just, it's just really cool. You're, okay, you're close. Uh, that's, we went dog sledding in Banff National Park in Canada. Um, and that's, that's Lake Louise right there, um, is what that one is. So um, there's that. All right, next one. This one's impossible. There's no way anybody's going to know this one, apart from people that were, like, there with us when we were there. That, the, the ocean. That's actually not the ocean. That's the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, that is in Cyprus, which is an island, a Greek island, uh, that we hear about in our scriptures that the Apostle Paul would have been involved in. Uh, there as well. All right, maybe a couple more that are a little bit more familiar here. We're getting closer to home with these last ones. Anybody know? That is, I heard it that. That's the Devil's Icebox in Colombia. A uh, pretty, really cool place. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to do that. It's, it's pretty fun. About a 30 minute drive away. Where's that one? That's Bush, yeah, that's Bush Stadium. Well, I've, I've been to Kaufman. I don't need to take pictures. Um, that's Bush Stadium, and where's that one? That's, that's Arrowhead. Yep, that's on the field at Arrowhead. 
So these are just some of my favorite places that I've been. But I think, and you've probably, I'm sure, traveled different places in your life. And the reality is we take pictures when we go to special places. And the pictures are great. But it's not like being there. Right? We take pictures so that we can try to elicit the response that we got emotionally and physically and neurologically and biologically when we were at these places that we love so much, whether they're man-made structures or geographical places. Pictures are great, but there's nothing like being there. And I think that there are some that are even worse than others. One of my favorites that people do, and if you've done this, I apologize. I'm not trying to make fun of you. But on 4th of July, inevitably, everybody's posting the pictures of the fireworks in the sky that they're like zooming in on their phone and it's grainy and whatever. It's like we all saw the same thing. Um, it's fine. It just doesn't do it justice. You have to be there to, uh, to experience the fireworks. Sunsets and sunrises are another one. Pictures are wonderful. But we all know it feels different when you're looking at it than when you take the best picture of a sunset or a sunrise. There's nothing like being there. And when we take pictures, we often can look, a point I want to make about all this is that we can look at pictures. We all love looking at pictures. We do, at my house, we have them all over the place and screensavers everywhere that are put, put in pictures about places we've been and things that we've done and honestly, sometimes just everyday life. But we love looking at pictures. But there's a difference between looking at the picture and actually beholding what's in the picture. To behold something and to look at it are two very different things. I think we can feel that. When we behold something, we have this emotional response when we get to behold some of the things that we get to behold, as opposed to when we just look at the picture and we reference something. When we behold something, we feel its impact. When we behold something, we feel its impact. And yet I think in our lives and in this world too much, we're drawn simply to look at a lot of things and we don't behold very many. Because we all seek after moments like this that I showed in some of the pictures, the moments where somehow we, we feel empowered and things feel right when we feel incredibly small. We seek out these moments and these places that it makes no sense that we would walk up to just a geographical location and have an emotive response to it. It's just a place. And yet we all seek these moments and we take pictures because we want to capture them. Because we recognize that those moments are fleeting. And they're hard to come by. And so we want to bottle them up. But we can't bottle them up. We can't always encounter them afresh and anew time and time and time again. But we seek after this feeling where we behold something, where we experience something, where we feel small because we feel the power of what's around us. And today, as a day where we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey, we wave palm branches, we remember the story as they shout Hosanna and welcome him. Today is a day to behold Jesus. Not to look at Jesus, not to look at our scripture, to behold Jesus. To behold Jesus in all of his power and beauty and recognize that the power and grace and love of Jesus is beyond anything we can encounter or experience in any other way. If we truly behold Jesus, we will always encounter his power. And at one point, Jesus' cousin, you might know him as John the Baptist, recognized this idea long before Palm Sunday even happened, before it was an idea. John the Baptist, you may know, is preaching in the wilderness and telling people to repent because the kingdom of God is near. Repent, repent, repent. This was John the Baptist's message. Nearly exclusively, this was John the Baptist's message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Until 
Jesus arrives on the scene. John stops his message and recognizes that in this moment, there is something else that's necessary for us to be doing. As Jesus approaches, everything changes. We see it put this way in John chapter 1, verse 29 in the English Standard Version. It says, The next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So as John the Baptist is, is baptizing people and preaching, repent, 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 and to, to cleanse yourself of your sin. In this moment, as Jesus approaches, John stops. His preaching changes in this time because Jesus is here. Christ has come. And John the Baptist says the right thing to do in this moment is to stop and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist says, before now you all have looked to me for spiritual direction and spiritual inspiration for guidance. And now it's time to turn your attention away from me. Look, it is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this word for look in the Greek as it was written is the word idu. And it's normally translated as look. That's why we use the English Standard Version today, because it uses the word behold rather than look. And I think in this moment, behold is an actually better word to be used in this instance. It's a better translation of what John the Baptist was trying to communicate when he says look. It's not simply to look at something, but to behold it. It's the thing we can all recognize when somebody says, hey, look at that. It's pretty casual. Hey, look over there. Check that out. It's not very often in our language today. If someone says, behold, it's a little odd. If someone says, look, we look. But if someone says, behold, we would interpret that entirely differently than if they just said, hey, look, so-and-so's here. Look at that picture. Look across the street. Look at what they're doing. I don't think that's what John the Baptist wants to say here. I think John the Baptist wants to say, Behold! Experience, encounter, recognize Jesus in all of his beauty, in all of his glory. He's here. And just like when we behold things as opposed to just look at them, we are changed when we behold. We experience, we encounter, we're transformed when we behold. When we look, we see. When we behold, we're changed. And I think it's normal for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to, to look at Jesus or to look to Jesus. We look at Jesus for, for guidance or for help. Well, what, what would Jesus do in my situation? We might look to Jesus for information. What did Jesus teach? What did Jesus say? We might look at, we might look to Jesus. And I think that these are good practices for our faith. We should look at Jesus. We should look to Jesus. We are, after all, Christians. We are Christians, followers of the way. It would make sense that we would look at Jesus, that we would look to Jesus for these things. But I think very often as followers of God today, especially 2,000 years after Christ's arrival, it is easy for us to look at Jesus, to look to Jesus, but it's not very often that we stop and actually behold Jesus, the Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I think it's, it's an okay thing 
that in our, in our culture, in our understanding, that we might see Jesus as a friend. We sing about it. It's one of my favorite hymns, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I love it. It's a great one, and it recognizes that God loves you so much that he wants to be near. I remember growing up when I was in middle school, middle school, high school, they made these, like, T-shirts that had a picture of Jesus on them, and I think it was worn by Christians who were trying to make Jesus cool or relevant or whatever, and it said, Jesus is my homeboy, uh, and I know that that stuck with me because I was like, that's a little strange. And I get what they're doing. They're trying to make, you know, Jesus isn't scary or intimidating or whatever. Jesus is my friend. And I'm not here to hate on the idea that Jesus is close like a friend or like a brother. That is absolutely true. Unequivocally true. Jesus came near in human flesh that that might be true. That God might be one of us. Changes everything. But oftentimes, we put so much emphasis on that that we don't really recognize who Jesus is, who our friend is. Do you recognize who your friend is? Jesus is your friend. Jesus might be your homeboy. But do you know who your homeboy is? Your homeboy is God the creator of all of this, the sustainer of life. That's who Jesus is. Do we understand when we look at Jesus or when we look to Jesus, who we're looking at, who we're looking to? Because I think if we did, we wouldn't just look to Jesus or look at Jesus, we would also behold Jesus. Scripture uh, has, a, has a word for this that's often misunderstood or misinterpreted. I mean, that word is fear. You may, you may understand the, or, or recognize the term that we should fear God, or, or especially in older translations, they use the word fear, but in our culture, in our context, it's misconstrued. But you may know that this word is fear in the Bible oftentimes, to fear God. That's not to be afraid, to cower, or to hide. To fear God in our scriptures, the better word that I would say in our modern-day context is to revere God. To revere God. What that means is really to understand who God is and to know who I am and to act accordingly. That yes, through the grace of God, Jesus gets to be my friend. That God gets to be my friend. What a wonderful story. What good news. But my friend is still the triune God of the universe. The creator of it all. The beginner and ender of life and of all things. The sustainer of all things. The one who, ca who causes the sun to shine, who knows the stars by name, and who put them all in their place. This is who our friend is. This is what it means to fear God. In, uh, in, in many of you in Advent, over Advent, took a uh, class with me on the line, the witch, and the wardrobe, and it was a lot of fun. And I shared in that class one of my favorite quotations from that book. In, in the book Aslan, the lion, you may be familiar, is the God character who comes in to save the land of Narnia. And, and the people who are learning about Aslan for the first time are hearing about this good news that Aslan is coming and he's going to come save Narnia. And they ask, well, he's a lion. That's scary. Is he safe? And the people who know Aslan say, no, he's not safe. He's not safe but he's good. He's not safe, but he is good. And this is the God that we pray to, that we bow to, that we sing to, and that we worship. He's not safe, but he is good. I'm going to remind us of that picture of the, of the Poaz uh, volcano in Costa Rica. You remember seeing that picture? 
seeing the picture is cool, um, but it's quite the feeling to walk up a, 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 an active volcano and see smoke rising out of the top of it. And they gave us hard hats, uh, you know, just in case. I'm not sure how much that's going to do. It's, I mean, I, it's saving me from, you know, lava rock hitting my head, I guess, but I might be more worried about the lava chasing after me. Um, but in that moment, you step up to the crater. And maybe you've had an experience like this in your life, too, where you say, if something happens, that's it for me. It's all over. Now, of course, it's safe, and, and the scientists and people who are leading it know when it's time that we, they need to close her down and things of that nature. But you still know this is beautiful in one moment, but then the next you say, holy cow, this is a volcano that can wipe out this entire region if the time struck. When we worship, when we pray, when we read scripture, do we always encounter Jesus at, at the chair next to us, at the pew across from us? Do we always encounter Jesus in the way that we want to see Jesus that makes us feel good and happy and safe? Or do we ever pray? Do we ever sing? Do we ever worship? like we're at the crater of a volcano when we view God. To understand God's beauty, but at the same time to know God's power. To, to fear God, as it says in Scripture. To revere God. Do we ever pray like that? Do we ever sing like that? When is the last time we had a moment like that with God? Because God is so big that we can recognize God as a volcano. More powerful than we'll ever know. Bigger than we'll ever know. But God is so great that God is also small enough to be our brother and our friend. And these things can coexist simultaneously. And it's the best for us when we can live as Christians in this way. To be inspired by a friend who is close doesn't feel that amazing to know that God is close and God is my friend. But when you begin to think about the creator and sustainer of life, would care to know you by name, that cares for you intimately and deeply. This is where we begin to understand the transformation. That God is beautiful. But God is not safe. But God is beautiful. And God is good. And so on, on Palm Sunday, as we see this person of Jesus riding on the back of a donkey who's not what we expected him to be, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And some people around are praising Jesus, shouting Hosanna, even though they don't really even know what they're shouting Hosanna for. They're placing their hope in whatever it is Jesus is going to do. But we also see people in our scripture kind of go up to these people who are laying their cloaks down and waving palm branches around, and they kind of nudge them. And they're like, what's the deal? Who is that? Who is that? And we may say, well, well, that's Jesus. But when, when we think about it and when we ask ourselves the question, who it is that we're shouting Hosanna to, who we're praising, and who we're praying to, if someone says, who is that? Our response in the way that we speak and in the way that we live and in the way that we act and in the way that we pray and in the way that we worship, our response ought to be, when someone asks us, who is that? Should be, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's here. He's come. Because that God is that big. 
and yet cares so closely. And so what I want to do as, as we close is, is to practice this. To practice our understanding of God's overwhelming power and might and, and bigness. Because that's what changes us. Jesus as a friend changes us in one kind of way, but understanding how powerful our God is changes us like never before. I'm going to practice envisioning us approaching the throne of God as if we're walking up an active volcano that can erupt at any minute and we know it, but it's beautiful. It's not safe, but it's good. And so I want to take a moment for us to pray. And Tenson, if, if, you'll, if you'll play um, whatever's on your heart, just give us a time to, to pray together. To pray on our own. The altar is open, if that's useful for you. To drop on your knees before God's glory and power and might. Because as we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem, we might look at him. We might look to him. But let's take this opportunity and take this moment to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's approach the throne together. Let's keep the same attitude of awe and glory as we rise to our feet 
and sing together. All hail King Jesus, as we behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us focus our attention and praise on the bigness and glory of our God. Hosanna, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has come. Our journey has become. As we walk through it together, let us behold this powerful and mighty God. Amen.